name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. O heavenly King, comfort of the Spirit of truth, who art ever present and fill us all things, treasure of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity and save our souls, O good one. Amen. Amen. So, we'll continue on, <clears throat> on the basic principles um, of the relationship of the Russian church with uh, um, with others. Did we finish section two, I think? Does anybody know? Anybody remember? Uh, yes, we did finish section two, Ladika. We're right at the beginning of section three. Okay. We can do three and, and get into four, maybe even finish four, I don't know. Okay, well, <clears throat> so who would like to read? Chris, you look like you're uh, re ready and raring to go. Let me. No uh, one, if no one's volunteering, I'd be happy to read. Well, yeah. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Everybody see the screen share? Okay. Yes. All right, go for it. Uh, so we're starting at three, the Orthodox witness before the non-Orthodox world. 3.1. The Orthodox Church is the guardian of the tradition and the grace-filled gifts of the early church. Her primary task, therefore, and her relations with non-Orthodox confessions is to bear continuous and persistent witness, which will lead to the truth expressed in this tradition becoming understandable and acceptable. According to the third pre-conciliar pan-Orthodox conference, the Orthodox Church in her profound conviction and ecclesiastical consciousness of being the bearer of and the witness to the faith and tradition of the one, holy, Catholic and Apostolic Church firmly believes that she occupies a central role in matters relating to the promotion of Christian unity within the contemporary world. It is the mission and duty of the Orthodox Church to transmit in all its fullness the truth contained in the Holy Scripture and the Holy Tradition, the truth which gives to the Church her universal character. The responsibility of the Orthodox Church, as well as her ecumenical mission regarding church unity were expressed by the ecumenical councils. These in particular stress the indissoluble link existing between true faith and sacramental communion. The Orthodox Church has always sought to draw the different Christian churches and confessions into a joint search for the lost unity of Christians so that all might reach the unity of faith. Any questions? Pretty clear. Yeah. Okay, keep going. Yeah. Uh, 3.2. The task of the Orthodox witness is entrusted to every member of the church. Orthodox Christians should clearly realize that the faith they preserve and confess has a global and universal character. The church is not only called to teach her children, but also to witness to truth before those who have left her. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Romans 10, 14. The duty of Orthodox Christians is to bear witness to the truth that has been entrusted to the church forever. Since according to St. Paul, we are laborers together with God. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. I believe the, the Greek on that is we are synergy. We are co-operators co in cooperation with God. Um, one of the things I have to say I like about this document is it is it underlines the real missionary imperative um, of uh, 
that we have as Orthodox Christians mm -hmm. to bear witness to the integrity of the faith and to the overcoming of the... Um, no, that's okay, no. To the overcoming of all of the uh, 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 breaks, in, breaks in that unity that uh, have come as a result of, of, sch of schism and sin. So let's go on to four. Uh, 4.1. The Russian Orthodox Church has carried on theological dialogue with non-Orthodox Christians for over two centuries. The dialogue has been characterized by the combination of a principled dogmatic approach and a fraternal love. The principle was formulated in the response to the letter of the Holy Synod of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, uh, 1903. As a method of theological dialogue with the Anglicans and the Old Catholics. With regard to non-Orthodox confessions, it was said, there must be fraternal readiness to help them by explanations, normal consideration for their best wishes, all possible forbearance towards their natural perplexities, given the age-old division, but at the same time, the firm confession of the truth of our universal church as a sole guardian of Christ's heritage and a soul saving arc of divine grace. Our task with regard to them should be without putting before them unnecessary obstacle for union by being inappropriately intolerant and suspicious, to interpret for them our faith and unchangeable conviction that is only our Eastern Orthodox Church, which has preserved intact the entire pledge of Christ that is at present the universal church, and thus to show them in fact what they should consider and decide upon if they really believe that salvation is bound up with life in the church and sincerely wish to be united with her. <clears throat> in other words, the whole point of, uh, of all of these dialogues with, uh, with the non-Orthodox is to, is to bring them to orthodoxy. Um, it's not about, uh, you know, and, our, and as, as Orthodox Christians, we have to affirm that we believe that uh, uh, the Orthodox Church alone is the one, is the fullness of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, um, uh, undistorted. Um, everything else is, is somehow distorted and, uh, or has been, has been lessened. We're, you know, it's not, you know, it's, it's not the kind of, um, uh, comprehensive, comprehensiveness of Anglicanism where, well, why don't we just all get along together and we can compromise and all this doctrinal stuff and, you know, everybody just have be, um, you know, have goodwill and, and and be nice. That's not what it's about. It's about it's about the issue of truth, and uh, you know, either Jesus Christ is God incarnate or he's not. Either God is the Holy Trinity or he's not. Either our salvation is the deification of our of our bodies, soul, and 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 noose, um, or it's not. And so we have to uh, uh, be very uh, careful in our, in all of our uh, uh, discussions with non-Orthodox that uh, we, we preserve that confession of, of the faith um, and, and try to lead them towards it. So, so, so kicking orthodoxy down people's throats on Facebook is not a not a good path to take. Say what? I was giving a very bad joke. <laughs> at kicking Facebook, kicking orthodoxy down people on Facebook. You know. No, that's not usually very good. It's not very not forbearing, good. and it's not very, and it's not usually very uh, uh, courteous. Yeah. And you can you can evangelize through Facebook or anything else if you want, but um, there's a way to do it and there's a way to not do it. And um, you know, calling people heretics and and writing them off and excoriating them and telling them they're going to hell is not very um, helpful. So, and especially since we cannot make such a uh, um, a judgment of them. So, 
Shall we keep going? Uh, 4.2. Characteristic of the dialogues conducted by the Russian Orthodox Church with other Christian confessions is their theological nature. The task of theological dialogue is to explain to her partners in dialogue the ecclesial consciousness of the Orthodox Church, the foundations of her doctrine, canonical order and spiritual tradition, and to dispel perplexities and existing stereotypes. Since people don't know much about orthodoxy, that's, there's lots of perplexities, that's for sure. Four point three. Mm -hmm. Representatives of the Russian Orthodox Church conduct dialogues with non-Orthodox confessions on the basis of faithfulness to the apostolic and patristic tradition of the Orthodox Church and the teaching of the ecumenical and local councils. Any dogmatic concessions or compromises in the faith are excluded. No document or paper adopted in theological dialogues and talks is obligatory for any of the Orthodox churches until it is adopted by the Orthodox Church as a whole. And that can only come from a pan-Orthodox synod um, uh, where, uh, where at least the consensus of the, of the entire church is, is, is um, seen. Master, is that hypothetically, if so, I, I wouldn't even know, you know, issue X, whatever, whatever that might be. If that were the case, is it a thing where a council would be called or is there like X number of years that a council gets together? Um, well, the last ecumenical council was in uh, 1979. <laughs> Um, yeah. There have been many uh, local councils since then, um, and in the most in the last twenty or thirty years, they've uh, they've started ex uh, convening councils of the primates of the churches. Um, but those still don't have the uh, the authority of an ecumenical council. Um, what what they tried what the ecumenical patriarch tried to convene. Uh, in Crete a few years ago, um, but which failed, um, would not have had the status of an ecumenical council, but it might have had the status of a local council. Um, that would depend on how it was seen by later generations, and not simply by its content or by its um, uh, specific um, how you know how it was how it was comprised so any other questions mm -hmm. aha is that a question okay you want to keep going on four four uh-huh from an Orthodox perspective, the way to reunification from the, for the non-Orthodox lies through the transformation and healing of their dogmatic consciousness and experience. Along the issue discussed in the, er in the era of ecumenical councils should be thought through once more. An important part of the dialogue with the non-Orthodox confessions is the study of the principle and theological heritage of the Holy Fathers, the mouthpieces of the faith of the church. So when, this of course is specifically dealing with the non-Chalcedonians and the Church of the East. Um, the whole the so-called Nestorian controversy and then the so-called Monophysite controversy. Um, because, you know, the perspective on, on those issues now, uh, 1,500 years later, is uh, quite a bit different than it was during, the, during that period. Um, and uh, I think it's, 
I think we need to we need to ask: Is it is it worth is it worthwhile remaining separate, or should we do everything we can in order to uh, restore the uni unity with the uh, with the with these other communities? Um, of course, the issues with the Roman Catholic Church um, do, uh, do not go back to the ecumenical councils. Uh, we share the same ecumenical councils. Um, it's it's a much it's a later uh, division. Um, important, just the same. Uh, the Russian Church has a very extensive um, uh, system of dialogue, both with the with the Roman Church as well as with the uh, non-Chalcedonian churches. Um, I think it's pretty much given up on the Anglicans and the Protestants, though. Um, so. It just uh, another Protestant question. Is is there a, I wouldn't even know the correct term, but a a higher body for Protestantism? Somewhere? No. No, yeah. No, that, that's the thing about Protestantism. There is no, there is no overarching authority structure. No. Um, and when, and outside of the major denominations, the history, which are connected with the historical church, there's no overarching um, uh, authority structure and there's no accountability. Uh, when you get into the evangelical or the Pentecostal world, there's, there's no, no accountability whatsoever of the local pastor to anyone. Um, and no doctrinal accountability, no, no organizational, no, uh, no moral accountability. So, um, and then you've got, then you've got with the, you know, the traditional Protestant um, historical churches that um, have completely abrogated uh, Christian morality. It's like, what do you do with that? So uh, the Moscow Patriarchate in particular um, broke off all um, all dialogues with the Anglican Communion, um, and said basically you can't even consider it a Christian body anymore. So, okay, next paragraph. Witness cannot be a monologue since it is since it assumes the existence of listeners and therefore of communication. Dialogue implies two sides, a mutual openness to communication, a willingness to understand not only an open mouth, but also a heart enlarged. Uh, I'm not sure what the, that CF is. Uh, that's a reference. CF 2, uh, 2 Corinthians 6.11. Uh, that is why the problem of theological language, comprehension, and interpretation should become one of the most important issues in the dialogue of the Orthodox theology with other confessions. Language is really important. Now, it's interesting that most of these dialogues are actually going on in English um, worldwide. Um, because English is now the common language uh, um, for uh, most international communication, um, and now also uh, for theological. But, but there's a tremendous, tremendous amount of um, uh, difference in how English is used between uh, Protestants, Roman Catholics, and Orthodox. And so we can be using the same words, but have absolutely no communication going on um, because the meanings are completely uh, uh, completely different. So um, so for example you can you can talk talk to your blue in the face you know sometimes with cer certain kinds of Protestants and you'll there'll be no communication. 
because the language is so different. And it's a real it's a real task for us to try and figure out what kind of language uh, we can use. You know, if you if you look at a lot of orthodox theological works, um, the uh, many of the technical terms are in Greek, um, and that's because uh, the English translations of those terms um, have uh, completely different meanings because they have a whole history of meaning within the English language, which refers to um, uh, the uh, um, well, which refers which refers to the um, to the Latin roots of so much of uh, English theological vocabulary. So. So translation is a big task, but it was a big task 1,500 years ago during the ecumenical councils. Is the translation important right now between the Greek and Russian? Yeah, my guess is that they probably use English between the two of them. And the um, and even the language for this council that was supposed to have been held in Crete was English. In fact, one of the uh, um, the patri the patriarch of Constantinople wrote to the patri or no patriarch of Jerusalem wrote to the patriarch of Constantinople. Um, uh, but he wrote in English, and Constantinople Patriarch rebuked him uh, for using English because he was a fellow Greek. So. And here I thought most of the people were uh, Arabs or Palestinians in Jerusalem. <laughs> well, in, the people are, but the, uh, the hierarchy of, of the um, Jerusalem Patriarch, it is all Greek. There's one or two Arabs, one or two Arabs, but the rest are Greeks. Did you say Western Greek? No, they're the rest of the rest of the uh, uh, the the Church of Jerusalem. All of the hierarchy are Greeks, and all of the bishops belong to the Greek. Um, uh, monastic brotherhood of the holy sepulcher um which doesn't admit arabs um i mean is official is that an official stance that they don't yep arabs or is that just kind of in practice it's both oh wow oh yeah Sad. well there's there's a big issue with uh um uh with with this kind of greek chauvinism um and it's especially being brought out right now by the uh, Patriarch of Constantinople, who is saying that the uh, uh, that as as the head that he is the head of the Greek community, the Greek speaking community, and and he has the divine right to rule of to rule the Orthodox Church by his ethnic heritage. By his ethnic heritage. So I. I don't think we, I I don't think we can accept that. No. So, um, and uh, so anyway. So sometimes um, it's not a monologue. Uh, sometimes it's a monologue between um, some the Orthodox churches. It's certainly a monologue. Uh, from Constantinople going to uh, to Moscow, um, and no matter what Moscow says, Constantinople doesn't hear them. Uh, it's a very a difficult situation. A very short question. I'm uh, half Ukrainian and half Russian. Is there any uh, difference between Ukrainian coming to Russia? I mean, uh, orthodoxy, I believe came from Ukraine to Russia? Well, it all came from Greece, actually. It all came from Constantinople to Russia. Um, but then um, there was no Ukraine. 
uh, Ukraine was, was simply the land of Rus. Um, and uh, then you have the northern tribes um, uh, who, were, who were the Russians. Um, and, uh, but the people of, of Kiev referred to themselves as the Rus. So, there, so the distinction between Russia and Ukraine is a much later one. Um, and so, but this has, but in reality, in, in regards to orthodoxy, nationality is meaningless. In regards to Christianity, nationality is meaningless. Um, our, we're citizens of the kingdom of heaven, and all of our earthly loyalties and things like that are, are beyond secondary. So that's, and so this whole, this whole um, philatist uh, thing of Greek, of Greek supremacy is nonsense so when it comes to the gospel. Pladika? Yes. Um, is, do the um, non-Orthodox look at this philatism and see that it um, impedes their understanding of our uh, true position as the church? Absolutely. Because, because what in practice we come off as a, as a, as a bunch of little ethnic sects. Hmm. And so it, it fundamentally distorts um, our message and the message of orthodoxy. Very sad. Very sad indeed. So, okay, can we move on? It is gratifying and inspiring that non-orthodox theological thought as expressed by its best representatives, has shown a sincere and profound interest in studying the patristic heritage and the faith and order of the early church. At the same time, it must be admitted that between orthodox and non-orthodox theology, there are still many unsolved problems and differences of opinion. Moreover, even the formal similarities existing in many aspects of the faith do not point to authentic unity since the doctrinal elements are given different interpretations in the different theological traditions yes exactly and that's that's that part of the matter of translation you can be using the same words but meaning totally different things Um, but one of the things that is happening, um, uh, certainly uh, in the Roman Catholic Church and in, um, and in certain of the Protestant churches, there has been a revival in the study of, uh, of the fathers of the church. Um, but uh, for some, it's, it's more, shall we say, fruitful than others. Okay, number seven. Dialogue with non-Orthodox confessions has revived the understanding that the one Catholic truth and norm can be expressed and embodied in a variety of cultural and linguistic contexts. In the course of a dialogue, it is essential for Orthodox theologians to be able to distinguish between a specific context and an actual deviation from the Catholic plentitude. It is also necessary to investigate the question of the limits of diversity in the one Catholic tradition. This is really important because there is, there is legitimate diversity, um, but it's legitimate insofar as uh, as the meaning remains the same, though expressed differently. Um, this is, I think, one of the things that was uh, 
has been dealt with fairly extensively with the non-Chalcedonian dialogue, um, where to a great extent they do mean the same thing as we do. It's just uh, expressed in a very different way. Um, and also the same thing with Roman Catholicism. Um, however, um, there are also very, um, uh, very different ideas that are being expressed, um, sometimes using the same language, which do not harmonize at all, and which can be seen to be um, as deviations from the, uh, from the faith of the, of the ancient church, of the undivided church, actually. Anyone else? Eight. Joint study centers, groups, and programs should be established within the theological dialogues. It is important that joint theological con conferences, seminars, and scholarly meetings, exchange of delegations, exchange of publications, and the information as well as joint publishing projects should be held on a regular basis. The exchange of experts, teachers, and theologians is also of great significance. Okay. One of the things that's, a, that's, a, um, that's interesting is that uh, St. Vladimir's Seminary in New York has, has really become a major center um, um, for theological encounter, as well as the training of clergy, um, of not only of uh, uh, people from the OCA, because it's an OCA seminary, but it also um, has, has many students who are non-Chalcedonians, um, Copts, uh, Indians, um, Syrians, uh, Armenians, um, and Ethiopians. Um, and so it's really become a center of, uh, of Eastern Christian dialogue in the spirit of, uh, of looking towards uh, uh, some way to, uh, to come together. So. You also you also have uh, a large amount of you, you also have students foreign students in the Russian seminaries uh, you have foreign students in the Greek seminaries uh, from these various churches as well um, though the Greeks aren't quite as open as the Russians are um, and then there's all these you know there are theological conferences and dialogues and meetings and exchanges and all of this kind of stuff. Uh, that go on. So, um, so number nine. It is especially important for the Russian Orthodox Church to send her theologians to the major centers of non-Orthodox theological scholarship. It is also necessary to invite non-Orthodox theologians to the theological schools and other educational institutions of the Russian Orthodox Church to study Orthodox theology. The theological schools of the Russian Orthodox Church should pay more attention in their curricula to study, uh, in their curricula to study of the progress and results of theological dialogues and to the non-Orthodox confessions. Mm -hmm. so we kind of just talked about that. Okay, any, any questions or comments before we go to 10? Okay, let's, let's do 10. Along with theological themes proper, dialogue should also be conducted on a wide range of problems involved in the relationship between the church and the world. Among 
the important areas in the development of relations with the non-Orthodox confessions is joint work in the service of society. In situations where it does not come into conflict with Orthodox faith and spiritual practice, joint programs of religious education and catechism should be developed. Yeah, well, and that's, that's an interesting idea. Um, I don't know how it would work, <laughs> but it's definitely an interesting idea. And 11. Actually, I didn't quite understand that. Like, how would, uh, how would you have, like, joint, like, how would you have joint classes or catechism with the non-Orthodox? Like, wouldn't that diverge quite early? Or? Well, no, not really, you know, um, especially if, you, if you're talking about Catholics or uh, uh, non-Chalcedonians. Uh, non the core of the faith is the same. Um, it's only later developments that have that have created estrangement, and so um, so all the basic doctrines of the Trinity and of Christology, um, uh, especially with the Catholics, and it's it's very, you know, we share we share far more than we than we uh, uh, than we don't, um, and this is. And then it, then it would have to, of course, be made plain um, uh, where, the, where the, the, the Latin church diverges from orthodoxy um, and, what the, and what the orthodox think about that. Um, so it's not, it's not a matter of uh, uh, not being honest, but, uh, but we, would, we would definitely need to, on one hand, present the universal tradition of the church, and what an orthodoxy is, is confident that um, our tradition is the universal tradition of the church. Um, uh, all the all the other all the all the various you know groups outside of orthodoxy have ultimately um, uh, distorted it. Um, so what, so basically anybody should be able to come to an Orthodox catechism class and they would be what, because what Orthodoxy is and we, and sometimes I have to say that one of the things that really gets me is, is we make so much of a, uh, we talk so much about Orthodoxy without talking about Christianity. Because orthodoxy, the whole point is, orthodoxy is ba the most basic form of Christianity. Not evangelicalism, it's not the Baptist, it's not, you know, it's orthodox. It's, and it's, this is the, this is the, this is the ancient faith of the universal church. You know, all these other schisms and all of these other um, sects arose later on, usually around some individual's kind of ego, but basic Christianity is what orthodoxy preaches. And uh, so it should be completely applicable for um, anyone to come to our catechism. And then of course we would baptize them into the Orthodox Church and that's what. What else is there to do? Right? So, let's finish off 11. The bilateral dialogues conducted by the Russian Orthodox Church differ from her multilateral relations and participation in inter-Christian organizations in that they are structured in size and form as she thinks most suitable at the time. The yardstick and criterion here is the success of a dialogue 
itself and the readiness of the partner in dialogue to consider the position taken by the Russian Orthodox Church on a broad, not only theological, range of ecclesiastical and social problems. So for example, there's this, this whole new moral idea that, that is being promulgated by the Russian Orthodox Church. You know, something utterly strange for the 21st century, that marriage is between a man and a woman, and that the unborn should be protected. You know, this, this new and novel idea, which of course has its roots in the ancient church, is, is, some, is, a, is a new message to the world. I'm being sarcastic. Um, but, uh, but, we, but what we need to do is we need to, we need to make sure that people understand, that, uh, understand this message and um, that it really is uh, at the heart of the, uh, uh, of, of, the Christian, of the Christian experience. So any, any questions about these so far? Um, Vladika, it seems, can, can you hear me? Yeah, oh yeah. Yep. Um, it seems like with some of the churches like the Roman Catholics and the non-Chalcedonians, it would be it would be more fruitful to have these, you know, formal interchurch dialogues. Whereas with the Protestants, it's because there's, I'm thinking that they would be less fruitful because even if you found someone who agreed, <laughs> they would not necessarily be accepted in any way by um, the members of their denomination. Right. Because there's no such structure. So maybe just interpersonal discussions are more fruitful in that in that second category, would you say? Yeah. Yeah. You know, the the various um well there's I mean, right now, especially you know, especially with the, the Protestant denominations, I mean there's there's really not a lot of point um in uh in having multilateral or uh either bilateral or even multilateral discussions other than simply to get to know each other now one of the things the russian church has done um and is to uh to build alliances um with uh evangelicals for example um, who tend to share the same values that the Orthodox do. Um, you know, the more, uh, certainly, certainly um, embrace the, the uh, major doctrinal points, but they also embrace the moral vision um, that the Orthodox uh, have. And so um, there's, a, uh, there's actually quite a bit of work being done by Metropolitan Hilary and Olfeyev um, establishing relationships, um, for example, he was very close with Billy Graham um, and remains close with, with Billy Graham's family and uh, is, you know, and, and he, sees, he sees them as a strong um, factor in American culture, which they are, um, to promote this, uh, the same um, spiritual and moral vision. Um, there was a, uh, there's a Presbyterian church uh, just north of Dallas uh, uh, where Metropolitan Hilarion also went to speak. Um, and he also, uh, big, with that parish anyway, and that pastor, uh, but it's a, it's a huge church, tried, you know, tried to promote a um, united uh, front 
uh, on some of these moral issues uh, affecting, affecting society. Um, and was very successful at doing so because they share that, they share that same moral vision. Theologically, there's, no, there's, there's not a lot of common ground. Um, American uh, uh, PCUSA and, um, uh, well, or PCA have very little uh, in common with, with the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, on one hand, theologically. On the other hand, when you look at uh, what they have on a, uh, um, in, in their moral teaching, they're strong because they're, they're conservative. But, but like with the Anglicans, it's hopeless. Or the Episcopalians, it's hopeless. Okay, shall we get into five? Somebody want to read? I can try. Okay. Number five, multilateral dialogue and the participation in the work of inter-Christian organizations. 5.1. The Russian Orthodox Church conducts dialogues with non-Orthodox confessions, not only on a bilateral, but also on a multilateral level, while also participating in pan-Orthodox delegations and in the work of inter-Christian organizations. So this would include the World Council of Churches, National Councils of Churches, and things like that, European Council of Churches. Five point two. With regard to her membership in various Christian organizations, she adheres to the following criteria. The Russian Orthodox Church cannot participate in international, regional, or national Christian organizations in which A, the constitution or rules require the renunciation of the doctrine or traditions of the Orthodox Church. B, the Orthodox Church has no opportunity to bear witness to herself as the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. C, the decision-making process does not take into account the ecclesi ecclesiological consciousness of the Orthodox Church. And D, the rules and procedures make a majority opinion obligatory upon the members. In the National Council of Churches, um, uh, they, you know, they, they do make these, these decisions, but then there's usually an orthodox um, uh, response to that. And so they don't require um, consensus on all of that. Otherwise, it would be impossible to work in those organizations. I, I remember a long, long time ago um, when I was attending a Lutheran church that our minister was, um, he was very ecumenically minded and he told me a story that once um there was a world council of churches and he said that um when the orthodox um contingent realized that the um the pagans and the witches were also invited to the meeting they decided to get up and leave <laughs> yep Well, some of those meetings become really wild, and um, and some of the Protestants, you know, especially 20, 30 years ago, were, were just going crazy. They had, I'm picking on the Anglicans here, but they make it easy. Um, uh, uh, you know, they had uh, Indian fertility dances on the high altar at St. John the Divine Cathedral in New York, and things like that. 
It was and all sorts of weird pagan stuff. Well, or like like recently in uh, in Rome, they had that they had that conference when they when the uh, when the Romans brought in these um, Amazonian um, uh, fertility idols, the Pachamama. That some that some brave soul went and he and he uh, th threw them into the Tiber. Being a hero, but you know, the, but some of the stuff that the non non orthodox do, and in, in the name of these inter Christian encounters, is is really nuts, and uh, we can't we can't in any way, shape, or form uh, validate that. So. Number three. The level and forms of the Russian Orthodox Church's participation in international Christian organization should take into account its internal dynamics, agenda, priorities, and general nature. Mm -hmm. In other words, know what they're getting involved with. 5.4. The scope and extent of the Russian Orthodox Church's participation in an international Christian organization is determined by the church authorities on the basis of its usefulness to the church, for the church. Five. While stressing the great importance of theological dialogue and discussion concerning the norms of faith, church order, and the principles of the spiritual life, the Russian Orthodox Church, like other local Orthodox churches, considers it possible and beneficial to participate in the work of various international organizations in such spheres of service to the world as diaconia, social service, and peacemaking. The Russian Orthodox Church maintains cooperation with various Christian denominations and international Christian organizations in the task of common witness before secular society. And that's important because I think one of the things that uh, uh, the, that kind of uh, participation in international Christian organizations can do is it can witness to uh, uh, the church's participation um, or, or, or that the church cares and actually is involved in people uh, or with people who are, who are suffering in particular um, uh, in secular society. They, uh, we don't you know, hold our noses and, you know, and go to the other side of the street, but rather um, we serve the poor, we serve those in need. And, um, and that's, and that's, I think, the great um, uh, witness of the Orthodox Church in these kinds of uh, organizations, um, its service to the poor. Can you explain that word, diaconia? Diakonia, uh -huh. yeah, diakonia. Um, um, uh, it's the same word as as uh, or the root word is the word deacon. It means service, service to the world. Um, and so, uh, especially in regards to feeding feeding the hungry and and clothing the naked and um, working with, you know, working with orphanages and hospitals and and uh, refugee organizations and and all of these these kinds of uh, social outreach kinds of uh, um, uh, ministries which are actually a very important part of the life of the church um, we don't see them very well in in the american orthodox world or, or american orthodox context and we're very deficient um, in those 
Um, but, uh, and some of the churches are extremely involved. Um, the Greek church, for example, is extremely involved in um, uh, the service to the poor and, and, um, and so forth. So, um, Youth Work II is, an, is another big deal internationally and but peacemaking that's kind of that's that's a little um, sounds a little soviet to me five point six the russian orthodox church maintains working relations on the level of membership or cooperation with a wide variety of international Christian organizations, as well as with regional and national councils of churches and Christian agencies specializing in diaconia, yeah. youth work and peacemaking. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think one of the things that um, we would do well to do is to emulate the uh, the remarkable ministry that the Russian Orthodox or that Orthodoxy has had in the past and and still does uh, in many places uh, throughout the world in its in its charitable outreach. Well, I, it's been about an hour. We can we can keep going and finish this off. Somebody want to read in six number six? Relations of the Russian Orthodox Church with the non-Orthodox of her canonical territory. The relations of the Russian Orthodox Church with non-Orthodox Christian communities in the CIS or the Commonwealth of Independent States and Baltic States should be carried out in the same spirit of fraternal cooperation in which the Orthodox Church works with other traditional confessions in order to coordinate social work, promote social harmony, and put an end to proselytism on the canonical territory of the Russian Orthodox Church. That's an that's an important statement. Um, obviously, the Russian Orthodox Church does not appreciate Protestant missionaries coming to Russia and uh, seducing their people with uh, all sorts of promises and and creating sect, all sorts of sectarian groups. Um, uh, for the most part, uh, you know, in Russia, uh, there's a great desire to reestablish that um, very ancient, uh, long-standing uh, Orthodox presupposition that there is one church that goes with the one society, one church, one czar, and, um, uh, and uh, that everybody uh, in the society is a member of that. Um, of course, this is not very American, and it certainly doesn't jive with the uh, agenda of the State Department, which is why they don't like the Russian Orthodox Church, among other things. Um, but uh, uh, it's very much the, um, uh, the Orthodox ethos that, um, uh, that rejects the idea of religious pluralism. Obviously, we accept other non-Orthodox other non groups, or we accept non-Orthodox groups, but uh, to be present. Um, but our idea is that everybody ultimately should be orthodox. Um, as far as Protestantism goes, uh, when I was in uh, when I was actually studying Russian in Monterey, we had a uh, he was a Mormon missionary that was doing work in Novosibirsk, but also in Kazakhstan, uh -huh. and I asked him like how his interactions were with the local Orthodox church there. And he made it very clear to me. And I was curious if this was like an isolated incident or 
like to where he was, or is this was common across the Russian Orthodox Church, but he made it very clear they did not set up any kind of organization or do any kind of program without the blessing of the local Orthodox bishop. Oh. Yeah. Like, like the Mormons went to someone from their Mormon organization, went to the local Orthodox bishop and got his blessing to do, like he gave, for example, like they would do uh, English language classes and they would get the blessing from the local bishop to establish English, English language classes. Oh. Yeah, I, I'm not sure, but I think both Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses were outlawed by the Russian, by the uh, Russian state. From my view. As, harm, as, as harmful sects. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if that's new. Last I checked, it was just the Jehovah's Witnesses. Because he also had to be very careful about that. He had to explain to people that they were not Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah. But yeah, from I don't I don't know if it's changed recently, but from last I checked, the Mormons were not officially on that banned occult list. Okay, because it's a it's a very you know it, there's not much tolerance of uh, of Mormonism by the Russian Church. Shall we say? But I'm I'm curious. I don't know if you know anything about it. But like, do other? I mean, is this common with other non-Orthodox group in Russia that they would go to the local Orthodox bishop for this? No, I'm sure. No, I'm well. I'm sure. I'm sure that's how they're operating now. Um, when I was living there in 1993, they certainly didn't. Um, and uh, uh, there was a deeply hostile uh, relationship between the evangelicals, and there were dozens of, and dozens of evangelical pastors um, and missionaries who went trying to buy people's souls um, with a pair of blue jeans and a $20 bill, you know? Um, and, uh, and so it, it, it caused a huge amount of confusion. So the Bob, but the Babushki had it figured out. They would go to the evangelical meetings, you know, and they'd get their blue jeans, and then they'd get their twenty-dollar bill, um, and then um, then they then they'd uh, go to the Orthodox Church. Uh, they'd buy a candle and and ask ask to be forgiven for going to the evangelicals, and then sell the blue jeans, and then they had enough to eat for the enough money to eat for the rest of the month. Master, uh, forgive me for saying this, but. Is, is that true? Is it, would they really yes. pay them out with money to, to convert? Well, at that time, yeah. Because money was just... Well, the ruble, when I lived in Russia in 1993, the ruble went from about 30 or 40 to the dollar to about 5,000 to the dollar. In other words, there was hyperinflation. Yeah. And, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't worth the paper it was printed on. They were just buying but, it was, but I have to say there were there were there were some you know the red ten ruble notes were just about the right size for toilet paper. Mm -hmm. it had a picture of Lenin on it. Yeah, but do you I, I guess this might be hard to say, but were they just um, I don't know, yesing them, yesing them to get money because they needed it. And sure, sure we're of course. We're, yeah, yeah. You know, but you know, but you, many of the Babushki over there are very simple people. They, you know, of course, you know, there's, there's the, uh, the old story of the Russian peasant trinity, right? It's, it's God, Mary, and Jesus, but Jesus died, so they put in St. Nicholas. Hmm. So you'd get these evangelicals who would go and stand outside Orthodox churches and, and preach to the Babushki who were coming out of the churches, and if the Babushki didn't hit them, um, uh, they would, you know, they would engage them in what they thought was theological conversation, but these Babushki couldn't do that, you know, so, um, but, you know, but they were faithful and they knew what, that orthodoxy was their faith, so, um, so they didn't give too much they didn't. They didn't give much. Uh, they didn't have much patience with the with the evangelicals. 
but it was a it was a bad situation. It was a very bad situation. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi, Scarecrow. Uh, I was just uh, curious about uh, multilateral discussions. And do they spend much time on the problems of youth uh, leaving the church? And uh, also, they seem to uh, feel that the church, uh, youth, those don't seem to feel that the church do not try to counter any anti-religious pressure uh, very dynamically. Well, you know, in, in Russia, the issues are very different than they are here. There is no problem in Russia with youth leaving the church. In fact, it's mostly youth in the church um, and youth coming to the church. And the, uh, their parents' generation, you know, um, us old guys, you know, are the ones who are um, still holding on to the old Soviet ideology. Um, so, so there's that. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very different cultural situation in Russia than it is here. Um, so, um, it's a, now we would, we would do well to, to have multilateral discussions between the Orthodox churches, um, or even within ROCOR about, uh, the problem of youth leaving the church because it's, it's an epidemic. Um, but I don't know if. They're interested in doing that. I can't hear. Should I go on? Sure. Six two. The Russian Orthodox Church maintains that the mission of the traditional confessions is possible only if it is carried out without proselytism and not at the expense of stealing the faithful, especially with the aid of material benefit. The Christian communities in the CIS and Baltic countries are called to unite their efforts for recon reconciliation and the moral revival of society and to raise their voice in the defense of human life and human dignity. Yes. It's also important to remember that this document was written in, uh, in, in the year 2000. So it, this still reflects some of that um, wild 90s um, that Russia went through. Um, uh, with the multitude of uh, uh, American carpetbaggers and West European carpetbaggers going in there and um, not only uh, trying to loot the society, but also trying to uh, steal the faithful and make them into Protestants. Also at this time, there was, it was just the beginnings of the, uh, of the major Russian pro-life movement. Um, and so that was, uh, uh, that's one of the things that I think that's being referred to here um, in the defense of human life and of human dignity. And it was also um, the pro-marriage, uh, anti-gay, Um, movement. I couldn't. I couldn't hear that. Oh, sorry. Now my mother's talking in the background. Oh, okay. Very good. Okay. Somebody want to read three? The Orthodox Church draws a clear distinction between the non-Orthodox confessions, which declare their faith in the Holy Trinity and the divine human nature of Jesus Christ, 
on the one hand and the sects which reject fundamental Christian doctrines on the other while recognizing the right of non-Orthodox Christians to witness to their faith and conduct religious education among the population groups that traditionally belong to them. The Orthodox Church is against any destructive missionary activity on the part of sects. So it's not, it's not an American style free for all. Right. You know, the idea is to maintain the integrity of the Orthodox Church and those, and those traditional cultural groups which have their own uh, church. Adika, what, what are those traditional cultural groups that have their own non-Orthodox churches? Well, there were uh, large numbers of um, uh, uh, Germans in, in Russia, for example. Some of them were Lutherans, and some of them were Anabaptists, like uh, Mennonites. Um, uh, there, uh, there's, there's, some, there's the Ukrainian Catholics and, and Eastern Catholics. There's, there's a small Roman Catholic population. There's small... Um, uh, there's a, been a Baptist, American missionaries brought the Baptist church there in the uh, 1890s, I believe. Um, and so these, you know, these kind of groups are, um, are just, have, have become uh, just part of Russian uh, religious society. Um, but it's, it's all the new, these new religions, all these evangelicals and Pentecostals and and uh, the free-for-all kind of American sectarian um, uh, chaos that is what Russia is trying to avoid. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I think we can, we can finish this off tonight. Somebody read, want to read seven? Seven, internal tasks in relation to dialogue with non-Orthodox confessions. While rejecting views which are erroneous from the point of view of the Orthodox doctrine, the Orthodox are called to treat with Christian love those who confess these views. In their relation with the non-Orthodox, the Orthodox should bear witness to the holiness of Orthodoxy and to the oneness of the church. In bearing witness to the truth, however, the Orthodox should be worthy of their witness, causing offense to non-Orthodox non Christians is inadvisable or inadmissible. Yeah. I think this is one of the one of the messages that should go out on Facebook. <laughs> you know, we have we have we have so many of the Facebook uh, Orthodox warriors that uh, they don't care who uh, who they offend or how how completely. And it's it's that's not the way to bear witness to Orthodoxy. Anybody else? 7.2. 7 7.2, it is essential to give the members of the Orthodox Church competent and trustworthy information about the progress, tasks, and prospects of the contacts and dialogue the Russian Orthodox Church with non-Orthodox confessions. Yep, that would be nice. So you might as well go on to three. The church condemns those who, by using inauthentic information, deliberately distort the task of the Orthodox Church in her witness before the non-Orthodox world and consciously slander 
the church authorities, accusing them of the betrayal of orthodoxy. These people who sow seeds of temptation among ordinary believers should be subject to canonical sanctions. In this regard, guidance is given by the decisions of the Pan-Orthodox meeting in Thessaloniki in 1998, the delegates unanimously denounced those groups of schismatics as well as certain extremist groups within the local Orthodox churches themselves that are using the theme of ecumenism in order to criticize the church leadership and undermine its authority thus attempting to create divisions and schisms within the church. They also use non-factual material and misinformation in order to support their unjust criticism. The delegates also emphasize that the Orthodox participation in the ecumenical movement has always been based on Orthodox tradition, on the decision of the holy synods of the local Orthodox churches and on pan-Orthodox meetings. The participants are unanimous in their understanding of the necessity for continuing their participation in various forms of inter-Christian activity. We have no right to withdraw from the mission laid upon us by our Lord Jesus Christ, the mission of witnessing the truth before the non-Orthodox world. We must not interrupt relations with Christians of other confessions who are prepared to work together with us. During Durant Orthodox participation of many decades in the ecumenical movement, Orthodoxy has never been betrayed by any representative of a local Orthodox church. On the contrary, these representatives have always been completely faithful and obedient to their representative church authorities and acted in complete agreement with the canonical rules, the teaching of the ecumenical councils, the church fathers, and the holy tradition of the Orthodox Church. A threat to the church is also presented by those who participate in inter-Christian contacts speaking on behalf of the Russian Orthodox Church without the blessing of the church authorities as well as those by, as by those who bring temptation into the midst of orthodoxy by entering into canonically inadmissible sacramental communion with non-orthodox communities. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, this is addressing temptations from both sides both from the right, those who criticize uh, 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 church authorities for to participating in, in um, ecumenical meetings, um, uh, and as well as those who uh, 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 participate on behalf of the church without a blessing, and especially those who uh, would do so such as to uh, actually uh, go to communion with the non-Orthodox, um, which of course separates them from the communion of the Orthodox Church. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the biggest problems that, uh, uh, that the church faces right now is, uh, is, is the sectarian zealots who, uh, who absolutely, who could, uh, condemn any kind of ecumenism, who condemn any kind of interchurch relations, um, and uh, who, you know, while there while there is while there is some merit to some of the criticisms, where uh, churches have actually um, adopted certain kinds of uh, uh, ecumenical agendas, um, that's you know that there are legitimate criticisms of that. However, for the most part, um, the Orthodox really do uh, observe, you know, the basic rules of, of how to conduct themselves as Orthodox Christians and do not betray the, uh, uh, the teaching or the, uh, uh, or of, the, of the church or its tradition, so.
it's it's an interesting there's lots of um, lots of issues that go with all of this so. Any questions on this section? The schismatics that they were uh, referring to would undoubtedly be the old calendarists. Okay. Somebody want to read the conclusion? Conclusion, the 20th century now drawing to a close has been marked by the tragedy of divisions, enmity and alienation, but in it, divided Christians have shown a desire to achieve unity in the Church of Christ. The Russian Orthodox Church has responded to this desire with a readiness to conduct a dialogue of truth and love with non-Orthodox Christians. Inspired by the call of Christ and by the goal of Christian unity as ordained by God. And today, on the threshold of the third millennium after the nativity according to the flesh of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Orthodox Church again lovingly and persistently calls all those for whom the name of Jesus Christ is above all other names under heaven, Acts 4.12, to seek blessed unity in the church. Our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged, Corinthians 6.12. Okay. So, I, I tuned in late uh, when I came in. Uh, uh, can you hear me now? I can. Okay. And uh, I didn't know who wrote this series of uh, items that uh, I attended, uh, I guess, from number four on. Oh, basically. Well, well, who wrote it? Well, this was written, I don't know who particularly wrote it, but this was um, adopted by the uh, Bishop's Council of the Russian Orthodox Church in the year 2000. I see. Thank you. Uh-huh. What else? Who who else has a comment, question? Nobody else? Y'all are not very talky tonight. <laughs> Now I'm actually I'm, I'm reading through Russian articles. I'm like I'm trying to find a, find this list of uh, it's the the law from 2002. It's the anti-extremist law uh -huh. that lists the banned sects in Russia, and I guess like the the Hare Krishna group and Jehovah's Witnesses are the only ones I've been able to identify. Uh huh. There are others as well. Yeah, I imagine there are. Yeah. It was it was pretty much there was a lot of, of religious chaos in the in the nineties. And um of course there was social and political chaos as well. Um so it, it's much better, I think, you know, I I tend to think they did well to uh um ban uh, some of these strange sects. Ladika, there's a question on the chat. Uh huh. Um, from okay. Dick. Huh. Interesting. Um, Eric, are the old believers considered the schismatic sect? No, um, they're, uh, 
uh, they are considered schismatic, and uh, uh, but they're uh, on on one hand, you know, it's a it's a homegrown Russian uh, problem and and issue, and so the it's it's much more understood to be a uh, a challenge to the church to reunite them to. Uh, uh, to the Orthodox Church fully and sacramentally. Excuse me. Of course, you know, the, the Orthodox Church can't, um, a lot of the old believers, you know, have lost the sacramental life of the church. They don't have the priesthood. They don't have, they don't have, bapt well, they have baptism, but they don't have any of the other sacraments. And so um, it's, uh, it's fairly distorted from normal orthodoxy. Anyone Vladika? else? Yeah, Basil. I may have heard some good news on that line that at least one or two uh, old believer groups have started to send some of their people to seminary to become priests. Oh, uh -huh. well, that's good. You know, in the long run, you know, it'll be, it'll be a very good thing uh, for their reconciliation with the church. So what else? Okay, well, <clears throat> so I think we'll, uh, uh, we'll wrap up for tonight, um, and uh, so let's pray. It is truly me to bless the Theotokos, ever blessed and most pure, and the mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, more glorious beyond compare than the seraph. Without corruption, thou gave us birth to God. So well. True Theotokos, we magnify thee. The blessing of the Lord be upon you through his grace and love for mankind, always, now, and ever, and to ages of ages. Amen. <clears throat>